And good afternoon, Zach Lechi. We are live this afternoon, Monday, November 5th, for our conversation about Dija Navani, the Lengua Viva, or Living Language, the wonderful project in the Oaxaca Valley in the town of San Jerónimo, Tlaco, Chihuahua, and now streaming, now gathering in Philadelphia at Haverford College. So everybody, uh, this is great that we're having this conversation. And I want to thank you for participating. I'm Ron Motter, and over here we have Moises, Katie, and Brooke, uh, all in this wonderful office in this linguistic hub of Haverford. Uh, can you introduce yourselves, please? Um, well, Saplaji, Arena Moises Garcia Guzman, Arena Gwich Zundro, and that we need new ones when far to la these are still. Uh, well, my name is uh, Moises Garcia Guzman. I am from the town of Tlacochawaya, and I am an activist uh, looking to preserve our native language in the town. I'm glad to be here. Uh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Moises Garcia Guzman de San Jerónimo Tlacochawaya, y soy activista de lengua y buscamos preservarla en la comunidad para no perder un elemento muy importante de nuestra identidad. Y estoy contento de estar aquí con ustedes. Um, no, gracias. My name is Katie Rogers. I am Harvard College class of 2018. And I was one of the student fellows um, this summer. Thank you. And my name is Brooke Lillehaugen. I'm a linguist and chair of the linguistics department here at Haverford College. I've been studying Zapotec languages and learning from speakers of Zapotec for almost 20 years now. And I've been collaborating with Moises for, boy, five or six years now. Six years. Um, and I was co-producer with um, Moises and with Katie and others on the film, on the documentary film series, Disha Navani this summer. Beautiful. Uh, well, again, I want to thank all of you for appearing in this conversation. I'm Ron Motter, the host of Planeta.com. And let's see, very stoked and psyched that we get to have a conversation across country and across continent all about uh, this wonderful language a video series, a 10-part series. The videos all more or less less than five minutes long showing the community life and embedding language with, with food and milpas and agriculture and markets and chocolate. Did I mention chocolate uh, <laughs> in this wonderful series of videos? So again, it's, it's one of the things that uh, is high on my list of best things of 2018. So, so thank you all. Uh, first kind of first question, uh, walk us through a little bit. Uh, you, the, the series uh, was, uh, was filmed earlier this year was, and it's been released week by week on Thursdays. Uh, Moises, what's the reception been? Well, it's been, um, it's had a great reception in the town first and also in communities outside of Plapachawaya. It's been a uh, great engagement um, in terms of language as well, because um, we see people having comments, um, we see people having this short conversations even in Zapotec, in, in the social media. So to us, the response has been great. Um, we are linking these communities, the ones that will live in Tlacochawaya, but also the ones that live outside of the town. And just for, for, for the folks that aren't aware, how far is uh, Tlacochawaya from Oaxaca City? Uh, about 22 kilometers from the capital city of Oaxaca. So it's about 25, 30 minute drive from Oaxaca City, um, eastbound on the road 190, that goes all the way to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Beautiful, well thank you Brooke for showing us there on the map. This is great. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Katie, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your involvement and 
and how uh, you interacted with the with the you know who are these students and how did you get along with the locals? Um, yeah, so those are two very big questions. <laughs> um, so I think everybody on the crew was involved in like all aspects. Like everybody was on camera or sound um, or translating. Like we all took turns. Um, and that was very cool because we all were very much part of all parts of production. Um, and I was um, one of the more experienced film students just because I, um, some people came to the project and had taken either one or zero film classes. Um, but everybody was a fast learner and yeah, so that's what my part of it was. And also um, all the students were part of discussions when we'd be talking about what we'd be filming and how we'd be filming it. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to say what it was because there was just so much going on. And then um, interactions with locals. I don't speak Spanish, nor do I speak Tech, so um, I had a limited pool of people that I could interact with. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think I had very pleasant interactions um, where I was very quiet, but <laughs> that was okay. Um, and then. I don't know. I wouldn't want to speak for the Spanish speaking students who are part of the project, but yeah. Mm -hmm. got to know like this. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 a, what, a, what a wonderful introduction. That's a great front door to, to Oaxaca for you. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I said, what a wonderful introduction to Oaxaca and yeah. to Mexico for yeah, you. I've met a lot of really great people. Oh, well, beautiful. Uh, Brooke? Uh, the reaction, how are people responding to this? Yeah, so going back to when Moy was talking about the reaction from the community on Facebook, when, when the possibility of this project came up uh, and I approached Moy and I said, it might be possible to have money for a team to do some sort of documentary media work in the broadest sense, would this be interesting to your agenda <laughs> and what could it be we had lots and lots of conversations over what our priorities would be what our goals would be and one of the conversations we had would be who is our audience and we had at the top being people from Tlacachalaya both in Oaxaca and in diaspora communities so that was our top but then we also defined other communities including academic communities educational purposes and so in terms of the reaction that you're asking about, Ron, I can speak some to how it's been received in like linguistic communities and academic communities. And I'm already hearing people using this in classrooms, using this in courses. So there's a professor at Cal State University Northridge who's using this as part of her course. And there's a professor here at Penn, I don't know if I told you guys who, he just used one episode, he used the episode in the market to, uh, to illustrate bartering in indigenous communities. Um, and excitingly, we have quite a long list of screenings where this is being shown in linguistics context at conferences or things like that. We'd love to have it kind of become better known in other educational settings. So this, I think, could be useful in educational contexts at lots of levels um, outside of college. Um, but so far, that's where the reception's been, and it's been very positive as well. Well, it's well, it, it, of course, as I say, it's, it's so well deserved. And great to see you over, what, 100 subscribers on YouTube? <laughs> Indeed, that was great. That's our Sorry. milestone. Um, I, I'd, like you to, I'd like to touch upon uh, collaboration. And we, we talked about this before but, uh, this chat began, and we've been talking about this for years. But... To get Moises uh, to Philadelphia uh, to do all of this work, uh, who have been your collaborators? Well, funding-wise, is that what you mean? Funding and and moral support, whatever you know. Who do you want to you know? You're gonna admit, you're gonna forget somebody, but who do you want to give props to? Well, in terms of making this whole project possible, it really wouldn't have been possible without a grant from. VCAM, which is part of Haverford College. It's a new center that promotes visual arts and cultures. 
And this grant made a lot of things possible. And so we're very, very grateful to that. But we've just had support from Haverford College throughout my time here. Um, so I'm really thankful to the administration, to CPGC, to Eric Hartman, who was actually the first person to find the funding to bring Moises here as a co-educator. So one thing that we're continually discussing in our partnership is how to work within a system where sometimes, well not sometimes, where there are inequities. Um, mm -hmm. and where do we push and how do we pursue our partnership in that? And one thing we observed is how much easier it is for me to get funding to bring students there. And of course, it's a great experience and I want to continue to do that. But we wanted to work on what the other side of that looks like. And so now this is the second time that Moises has visited Haverford. The first time he taught in three courses and all three students, all students in those three courses told me it was the first time that they learned from an indigenous person at the front of the room instead of reading about them. And so all these little things, like it may seem like a small thing to bring someone here for a week or something, but all these little grains of sand contribute to the ways that we're trying to, to cooperate together and to, to pursue this kind of work in this really complicated international multicultural way. What do you think, Lori? Right. Um, to me, it's a great experience as well because now this makes it, uh, to me, uh, have a sense of a true collaboration because now it's going both ways. It's a great experience to have people from Haverford visit us um, in summer and work on these projects, but now also it's um, a great um, way to for me to be here to visit classrooms to tell people about the community, about our lifestyles and uh, our language, which is the main feature that we are pursuing to preserve. So it's a great way for me. It's truly uh, something special to be able to, to make it and be here in, on campus. Moises, was there any interest in your part for finding a colder time of the year to visit Philadelphia? <laughs> well, both times that I've been here, it's been kind of chilly, but it's, it's a good experience as well, too. Oh. I, I still like listening to Oaxacans when they talk about how cold it can be when they haven't really had cold in the valley. That <laughs> <laughs> Good grief. Um, well, what's next for, for uh, Deja Navani? I, I know there's a big screening tonight, but uh, what sort of events, what sort of uh, follow-up activities are there? Well, uh, tonight we have the uh, the screening here at VCAM and um, at Haverford, and then uh, starting November um, 17, we start with a screening in Tlacochawaya. We continue in uh, Tlacolula, and then we go to Setis, a high school in Tlacolula where I teach, and then we continue with um, Centro Académico, Centro Cultural San Pablo in. Uh, um, capital city and then we're looking into it's not confirmed yet we're looking into an um a screening in centro cultural de teotitlan del valle which uh, just opened um, a few weeks ago um that's what's next for the screening but now in terms of the project we are really happy that we were able to incorporate all these elements of language in it can you go into depth you were just discussing this before a bit, you know, what's so important about that or what's the, what's the idea behind what you're talking about? Behind, behind it is that um, everything that we know from our culture, being food, recipes, music, uh, cultural heritage, came to us through language. So it is really important, it's crucial to incorporate, to link those elements into language preservation because um that's what i think it's going to make people um more uh, to be more interested in these efforts because they're going to see that it's not only language but it's every single feature of that identity that it's being pulled together into this project so that's what i really like about this project 
that we didn't focus only, but what elements are into play to conform this language? Okay. Um, I want to ask the linguists in the room. How do you say chocolate in, in, in the various in the various local Zapotecs and languages of Oaxaca? Yeah, there seems to be two main ways to say it. One is as they do in Tlacachawaya, where they borrowed the word from Nahuatl in something like chocolate. Others took the Zapotec word for sweet or fruit and kind of expanded it. So in a neighboring Zapotec language, the word for chocolate is nash. How do you say like sweet? Uh, sweet, fruit, nash. And that's also the term using um, Teotitlan del Valle, and I think also in Mahul Sochit, they use that term for chocolate, nash. But it's for yes. something sweet. In our case, we borrow it from Nahuatl, and we use chocolate. So those are two strategies. One was kind of expanding the use of a native Zapotec word, and one was borrowing a Nahuatl word. Mm -hmm. I remember very good times with my friend uh, Angela Mendoza, who taught me Cayagua Nash, or I am drinking chocolate. Listen to him. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> oh, it was 10 years ago, back in 2008, where we did the English language training course in Teotitlan del Valle. And I thought in terms of equaling things out, I would go and learn Zapotec. Otherwise, it would be, why are these people just teaching things? And it was more of a conversation and, uh, and again, appreciating and again, appreciating the differences, which was so obvious when you go to Oaxaca City to a market and you would ask the different vendors, well, how do you say blue or red or well, my favorite, orange in Teotitlanda uh, Valle, Guchnia, because Guts is yellow and Schnia is red. So orange would be Guchnia, like our Guchnia president. But, uh, <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Uh, but again, these variations of the language, mere kilometers apart. And even within communities, and that's one thing that we try to do in our work is to not set one of these ways of saying a word as the standard or the norm, but rather show the diversity and celebrate the diversity that even within an, a single town, there can be more than one way to say a word. Beautiful. Allow them you know, to have them all on equal footing. Right, uh, taking in co into consideration these differences or these varieties that we have even within the same town, I think it enriches this, um, these efforts because now you are not setting the norm of a single way of saying things, but rather you are acknowledging that there are different forms even within the town. And that acknowledgement is that enriches it and makes people want to participate but also makes them feel that we are taking all of them into consideration we're not singling out but we are rather pulling all together in a broader perspective and i applaud that effort but in a broader effort uh are we seeing this at a at a, at a, at a grander scale in the state of oaxaca or in the country of mexico are we really doing enough to appreciate the diversity of the languages I don't think we are, but this sets the precedent, this sets the bar, right? We are um, doing something really different, something new. And also one thing that it's really important is the ethical treatment of all the materials, because that's also one thing that I understand sometimes it has this sort of, uh, not controversy, but um, people tend to think, okay, what's going to happen with this material? How is it going to be treated? But it's important to mention that in this particular case, the community owns the material. It's, they are the owners of all raw materials and that gives them or puts them in charge of it. So, so part of what we agreed to and part of what we'll be doing when we go to Oaxaca is bringing two hard drives with all of the raw footage. Do you know how many hours we shot? 
that's more than 20, but I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think that sounds right. So there's, there's lots and lots of raw footage there that is language documentation, cultural documentation, um, all of the raw materials that we're giving, uh, more like turning in, turning into the community uh, for archival purposes, but also hopefully for new creative purposes. There's mm -hmm. lots of ways that the material that we didn't use or even the material that we used could be repurposed. Um, and I hope it is. I hope lots more come out of that. So we'll be giving that to the Municipio on the 17th. Is that the date? Mm -hmm. Sunday, November 17th is when we'll be turning that in. Okay. Um, I want to touch base on two topics. Uh, digital responsibility and digital assets. Uh, it's often been said that digital materials, la you know, survive for about five years. They always talk about how it just lasts and lasts and lasts, but we know a lot of things disappear. Um, one case would be, you know, the, the, the Wikispaces website that I, I have been using and many other educators have been using for the past 10 years just kind of went under. Likewise, uh, the Flickr site where I posted the photos from uh, the visit five years ago with Moy and his mom and Flacco Chowaya. You know, Flickr is going to change its policy from providing unlimited photos to everyone to a thousand photos to people or unlimited if you pay their newly established, you know, premier $50 a year account. But as I said, what are your thoughts going into this in terms of digital assets, in terms of these materials? Uh, how long will they be useful for? Uh, is there, is there a consideration of training or getting people here's what they are or does a municipal you understand already have a collection of digital resources i've, I've, I've asked you a big pack question so good luck let me answer part of that so whenever you're working with endangered language materials you need to be very thoughtful about what you will be doing with those files that you create and how you'll be archiving them um, I archive all of my work, and at the beginning of this project, we discussed this, and we decided that we would also archive all of the raw materials uh, for this project with a digital archive that's run out of the University of Texas at Austin called ILA, the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America. They have a commitment to continually seeking grant money. They've been funded by NSF, NEH, and they have a commitment for a long-term preservation of indigenous language materials. They have materials from all over Latin America. They have materials for languages that are no longer spoken. In the case of the fire in the museum in Brazil, they had actually had some of the materials that linguists had worked on that were documented there. So in a way there was another copy. All of these materials and all the endangered language materials that I work on, I deposit there so that after I am dead, there is an institution who has a commitment to continually making these files be accessible to modern people in 100 years, 200 years. In terms of training people in collective files, that's something that needs to be on our agenda. It's not enough to just right. say, here's a hard drive. Yeah, I think this also is something uh, completely new for the town. I know there have been um, documentations, private documentations, let's say just um, home videos that people have. But in this case, it's something um, it's something big because it's professional um, uh, films. There are professional films. They are well planned. Uh, so it's it's something that it's really organized. So also this also will set the bar in terms of digital um, material that the municipio is going to, to have available. So that would be also part of training, part of telling people um, how to manage and preserve this material as, as well. Beautiful. Hmm. Um, beautiful. I, upcoming events. Um, this week is Responsible Tourism Day uh, on Wednesday, and we wish our very best to friends in London attending the World Travel Market. I'm gonna be the person kind of pushing and shoving these things together. Uh, I love the idea that 2019 is the International Year of Indigenous Languages. 
and that travel and tourism can play a, a positive role, particularly as we visit uh, the Oaxaca Valley, those wonderful markets, the beautiful Baroque church in La uh, are, are you giving any thought to how we might connect the dots between indigenous language and travel and tourism in the coming year? Well, it's, um, it's linked because um, these web series is the first time that it, within the town, it links all these elements, food, agricultural, um, music, dance. So I think it's, um, it has a great connection with um, um, the year of indigenous languages with the travel um, events that are coming because it shows uh, from within the town, how do we see ourselves, how this, how my activity or what I do helps me to keep identifying myself as Zapotec rather than having this vision from outside that sometimes it's not complete, it's incomplete and to me this is but it shows it shows me as a zapotec person and how is it that i continue calling myself zapotec why is it that i still do it and how what i do i'm trying to preserve it and to pass it on to others it, it has a great link and i think if it's uh, properly managed it can be a great asset to put into this language uh, revitalization efforts and also tourism because we are not portraying a conventional tourism uh, image. No, we're doing something different. And that is also part of what I like of the um, summer stays because it parts away from the conventional visit. The students are there, they leave there, they stay there for a month. They eat what we eat, they help prepare what we eat. So it's a very, um, a completely different experience. It's not the conventional experience of visiting, but rather being involved in our daily activities. Well, I guess we have to talk to Katie again. Katie, <laughs> do you agree with that sentiment? <laughs> and and did, you, did you, were you making tortillas or tamales? Um, I oh. was not. <laughs> oh, I did, I did. Um, okay. we. Uh, with the, what is it called again? The grinding stuff? The metate. Yes, the metate. Um, we were, when we were filming the two um, videos on chocolate and then tortillas, we took turns and it was very hard. <laughs> My mom makes it look really easy <laughs> and it's very hard. <laughs> can, I, can I add something to what Moi was saying? Please. You know, lots of tourists go to the market in Flakalula. And I didn't think about this until just now, Ron, even when you had mentioned it before. But now, you know, that episode with your mom in the market, Moy, I think would be really interesting for even casual visitors to the Flakalula market to see. Because I think here they're seeing a Zapotec woman narrate in Zapotec what the market is to her what the market is to her as part of her identity as a Zapotec woman and how she navigates the market as a buyer and a seller and a barterer. Whereas, you know, if someone's there as an outside tourist, they're seeing one vision of the market and this is a vision of the market that they might not have considered that might, you know, expand their understanding of the market either before they go or, or afterwards. Right. No, that's right. Hey, hey, no I, I'll jump in quickly, but, uh, you know, to me, it's always been about the point of view, and far too much of travel and tourism is spoken, is addressed solely from the viewpoint of a traveler slash tourist slash visitor. You know, we're not considering locals. Uh, whereas, honestly, if you want to have any good experience, you have to balance the points of view out so that the locals are not uh, unhappy that they have these visitors, but are feeling that there is a mutual benefit that that uh, elusive win-win-win scenario. Uh, but how often we do not address the other point of view. So, you know, the video, and as I say, any kind of consideration of locals visiting local spaces, one, it's great to see as a video. And second, you know, when you have the opportunity 
uh, and, and I certainly did in living in Oaxaca, but you know, visit going to the tourist sites with Zapotecs, that's a different experience of Monte Alban. Or befriending the artisans and, and seeing how, and again, their interactions in the market. Again, it's a life-changing and life-affirming experience. Can I ask you a question, Ron? Please. <laughs> Do you have a favorite episode so far, or? I love the scene, the scene, the scene that I love the most right now is, of course, the last one from Chocolate, where, again, you see the reflection of the face in the, in the chocolate. <laughs> and again, that to me is this, it's cinematic glory that is so beautiful. Yeah, that was quite quite a day to shoot that. Everyone was hot, but then by the end, it smelled like chocolate. chocolate all <laughs> over the place, and uh, it was just irresistible. <laughs> irresistible, boy that that should be the that should be the tagline of of Oaxaca. Good grief! Uh, I, I want to wind up this chat. Uh, we've gone now for about a half hour, but are there anything that we haven't discussed that you'd like to bring up? Well, one thing that I want to point out is these collaboration efforts, because I'm pretty sure there are going to be many more, not only in Tlacochawaya, but in many towns. Uh, right now in my high school, we're working on this sustainable project, sustainable project ideas that students might have from their towns. So I know these collaborations um, are going to come up again. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is that it is really important to have a clear conversation, honest feedback, and genuine conversation about the expectations, the outcome of what is your expectation when you start this type of collaboration. Um, how is it? Who is going to do what? And how do we manage the final result? I think that's one point to um, thank Haberford College because it's been on um, ethical management of all the information because the rules and everything were set at first on clear expectations. I am really thankful about that. And also um, in the community uh, that um, I know people sometimes are not used to see other people working in the town, but in this case, the, the response has been positive. And for other people, other towns who would like to start something like this, it just, it's just like a recommendation of what to do. But I, think I am really thankful for this. Beautiful. And thank you for inviting us into this. It's. Uh... The work, this kind of work is hard. Like Moy says, it's unless we're constantly feedback talking, you can easily end up on different pages. Um, but we've managed to build a partnership and can't wait to see what's next. <laughs> I'm sure you're a couple steps ahead of us already. <laughs> Katie, anything else from your viewpoint? Um, you should, for those watching, check out the video. <laughs> Hey, honestly, Katie, would you recommend this to other students? Re recommend the experience you have <laughs> of going to Oaxaca to taking part in a collaborative I, exercise. Or I go to Oaxaca. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was a really incredible experience. Um, I learned a lot, um, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, but you guys worked <laughs> really hard too. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's, I don't know when you're enjoying the work. It's Still fun. <laughs> well, it is. It is absolutely uh, a beautiful what, what you've done there, and uh, many thanks to you. Um, we'll wind up the conversation here, and again, these conversations don't end, but they go on. And again, many many thanks. What you've done again is one of the best things of 2018. So, thank you for inspiring us. Thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you for your you, support Ron. and for hosting this. <laughs>